This program contains true stories of rescues. All of the 911 calls you will hear are real. Whenever possible, the actual people involved have helped us reconstruct the events as they happened. When a life is on the line, every heartbeat and each passing second is precious. I'm William Shatner. Tonight, true stories of courageous battles to survive and the heroes who try to make a difference on Rescue 911. We begin early on the morning of March 4th, 1989, in the snow-covered mountains above Great Barrington, Massachusetts. As ski instructors Louis Alessio and his 52-year-old wife Marty set out to enjoy their first run of the day. started skiing 20 years ago and we've been doing it ever since where do you want to go this time oh we'll go down that hatch okay it's just an enjoyable thing for the two of us to do but that's an important part of our life because Mary and I do things together and we have always <laughs> let's go and uh, when I get to the bottom I'll buy a hot chocolate all right, all right. sounds all right. good let's sounds go good deal. That hatch is our favorite trail. We like to ski the edges, Marty on the right, and I on the left. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw her start to fall, and you fall a lot when you're skiing, you slide along and, and eventually come to a stop. But she kept sliding. I was worried that she had broken her back. I was worried she had broken her neck and she wouldn't walk anymore. Ready. I looked at her, her eyes were open, her mouth was open. In that little time, I just couldn't believe how cold she was. No. Help! Help! I, I just couldn't believe that this had happened. I kept telling myself, don't lose your cool. She needs you now more than anything. Help! Help! The only thing I said to her was, Marty, please don't leave me now. Help! 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 When we continue, Things in my head were going, you know, what am I going to do? Because we've been married for 32 years and we're a team. I don't want to lose my partner. Not Joe Mosa, head of the Butternut Basin Ski Patrol, immediately rushed to the scene. instructor had hit a tree, I expected to see a gory mess when I got there. Jeff, go direct traffic. I didn't find what I expected. Marty was not bleeding at the time. There was no blood. Okay, Marty, it's Joe. Uh, Joe Marty, right? I'm going to feel your neck. Can you feel that at all, Marty? At that time, I started my initial survey. Down your arm. Can you feel it? Does it hurt at all, Marty? And when I felt the stomach area was very, very hard and pulsating, which meant uh, we had some internal bleeding. At that time, I became very, very worried that if we didn't get her off the hill in a hurry, that we may lose her. Go down to the ski patrol. 
get ready to go to hospital. Whatever. At that time, I felt that it would be better to have Lou off the hill. So I told him to go down to the ski patrol room and get ready to assist down there when Marty came off the hill. It was hard for me to leave her, but I felt that she was in good hands with the ski patrolman. As I started down the mountain, I had a very difficult time trying to ski. My legs were just like rubber. Things in my head were going, you know, what am I going to do? Because we've been married for 32 years and, you know, we're, we're a team. I don't want to lose my partner. Okay, move it out. Tony, go. It took us less than eight minutes to make our exam backboard Marty, get around the uh, toboggan and take her down to the waiting ambulance. At the base of the mountain, they were met by EMT Mary Berryhill. Are you awake? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Uh, okay, okay. Uh, Good. Okay, let's get her in the ambulance. Uh, okay, it's going to be count. very cold. One, two, three. Uh, straight her breathing, her facial yeah. expression, she looked frightened, and her inability to, to breathe enough so that she could speak words told me that this lady was in trouble. Marty was rushed to Fairview Hospital, a small facility close to the slopes for treatment. En route, her condition continued to deteriorate. Marty, at this point, blood pressure had dropped quite a bit. Her pulse had increased dramatically to 130, and her respirations were even more distressed and difficult. She had all the signs pointing to a very, very serious injury. What's going on, guys? Surgeon George Vinaglu was called in to examine her. She had no breath sounds on the left side of her chest, which indicated that she probably had a collapsed lung from the trauma. George, I got the chest filled. Let's see what we got. Okay. She's got a whole bunch of broken ribs here. I was very suspicious at that point that she had a fractured spleen simply because she had a lot of broken ribs on the left side. We'll go into the OR. Just before Marty was taken to surgery, her son Chuck was allowed to see her. Hi, Mom. I told her that I loved her. And I asked her to squeeze my hand just to let me know that she was listening to me and to let her know that I was there. And she responded by squeezing my hand, which was a very, very comforting for me because my mom was still there. She wasn't just a body laying on the table. She was fighting. I realized that we were going to do a major procedure and I needed a helping hand my associate was away that weekend, so the only doctor that was available to help me was Dr. Nemo, the gynecologist. Knife, please. We're starting. Okay. Let's get going now. Her spleen was normal. However, the diaphragm was bulging into the abdomen, and it became very obvious to me that she had a lot of blood lot of on the right laps. side of her a chest. Lot of laps, okay? Just going to explore here. Where did it happen? Friends and family yeah. waited for word of Marty's condition. I'm thinking this, this can't be happening. I can't thinking this is a dream. Um, why, would, why would this happen to my mother? Uh, she's the nicest person in the world. She's a good skier. Um, there's no reason for this it, to be happening to someone like this. I knew it was bad because when I saw her body just come to an abrupt halt, my heart just fell to my stomach. This is, this is the woman that, who's raised me from a baby. And now there's nothing that I can do to help her except pray. A lot of things were going through my mind. What if she had a real major chest injury? We don't do this type of surgery at Fairview Hospital. So uh, in the back of my mind, I thought, well, maybe I should send the patient to another bigger institution where they do heart cases every day and it's a daily routine for them. But then I thought it, thought it over again. I said, well, if I send her anywhere else, she would be dead. And the reason is she was so seriously injured, the time was of the essence. OK, let's extend that incision to the right side. Just have to wait and hope that, uh, hope that, hope that the injury internally is not too bad. I started thinking about you know, the worst thing that could happen. 
uh, I actually started thinking about, you know, funeral, what, what to do. I had a great deal of trouble telling myself that, you know, these people are going to help her. Okay, there's a lot of blood in the right chest. We saw a pulmonary artery laceration. We put a clamp right onto that, and we got the bleeding controlled. Then I opened the sac around her heart because there was blood around her heart. And once we opened the sac, it became very obvious that a piece of the rib that was broken poked a hole in her heart. I think that's what caused the hole in her heart. We put a clamp on the right atrium, and then I put my finger on the opening that she had in the right ventricle. Uh, it stopped the bleeding, and at that point I thought, okay, we can fix this. Uh, she's going to make it. It's going to be okay. But as we were doing that, she had a cardiac arrest. Good. She's fibrillating, and let's have the paddle. I requested to get the internal paddles. They said, what internal paddles? We don't do any open heart surgery at Fairview. Everybody clear. It was a situation like MASH a situation where we needed a lot of resources and some things that were not available and we had right. to do what we had to do with what we've got. Hi, I'm Dr. Vinogu. I am Marty's husband. Dr. Vinogu came in and he looked at me and he said, I don't think she's going to make it. She's got a hole in her heart this big. We sewed it up, but she arrested several times, and uh, I'm not sure exactly what's going Dr. to happen. Dr. Vinoglu, I need yes. you in the OR staff. When Dr. Vinoglu left the room, I said, that's it. She, she must have died, and uh, I've lost her. Be fit. George, oh, on, be fit. Be fit. All right, let's defibrillate quickly now. Charge. We're there. Still be fit. Okay, let's do it again. Go. Still be fit. A nurse came in and told us that they'd like to have us go to the meditation room. Be there, so if you just gather up your things and follow me. That's the point that I thought, well, this is where they're going to tell us the news, you know, that I've lost my wife. A nurse came in and said, we thought you'd be more comfortable here because you're going to be right by Marty. She's right down the hall in the intensive care. And with that, I had a big sigh of relief. Over the next two and a half weeks, Marty slowly recovered, but she cannot forget how close she came to dying. I remember I saw an operating table from a distance, and I couldn't see anyone's faces, but I knew that it was me on that table somehow, and I knew I had just died. And I just sort of felt, no, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna die. And then it was gone. The scene was gone just as quickly as it appeared. Then the next thing that I uh, remember is waking up. All right. It was very hard thinking about losing Marty. What goes through my mind now is, uh, especially when they run up to Grandma, and give her a big hug and a kiss. You know, that, that makes me probably most appreciative that she's still around to enjoy all that. Because uh, I wouldn't want it any other way. <laughs> There's a baby in there somewhere, yeah, there he is. <laughs> Miracles are made. Miracles don't happen. Wow. And Dr. Vinoglu and his staff made this miracle. He's probably the the best man i've ever met in my whole life i uh i own the biggest debt of gratitude he could uh he could ask me any favor in the world when i do it for him i'd probably do it 10 times over it doesn't matter what it is for me to stop skiing would be like not breathing so it was natural for me to go back to skiing we feel that skiing is a, is a very safe sport uh, this was just a freak accident. Whoa, no, it got me. <laughs> hey, how you feeling? Good. good. I feel great. Cold? It's so good to be back out here. Yeah. I could sit in a rocker for the rest of my life, and I would probably be safe, but that's not living. Going out and skiing is living.
that's what I want to do, and that's what I'm going to keep doing. Well, I want you? a hot chocolate. You owe me. Okay, I owe you a hot chocolate. Yeah. That's a deal. Okay. All right.